So good evening all. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Optimizing Use of Primary Sense webinar. My name is Harry Howell. I'm the Senior Project Officer here for Primary Sense at Gold Coast Primary Health Network. Tonight we are joined by Dr. Lisa Beecham as our guest speaker. Dr. Beecham has been a GP on the Gold Coast since 1997 and also sits on the GCPHM board. Dr. Beecham has been using Primary Sense in her practice close to three years now. Tonight, Dr. Beecham will demonstrate her practical and clinical insights from using Primary Sense tool in her practice to close to three years now. I would first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet virtually tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And before we do get Lisa to start to some housekeeping, uh, tonight is being recorded, so it may be shared as a resource later. Please keep your cameras and off and mics muted and we'll have opportunity at the end of the session for any questions. If you have any questions throughout the uh, webinar, please add them to the chat. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight to discuss Primary Sense. Uh, it's an exciting journey that we've had here on the Gold Coast. Um, it started development some four or five years ago, and it began as a Commonwealth Government Innovation Grant here in Gold Coast PHN. Um, and we decided that the existing data extraction tool that we were using wasn't giving us some of the functionality that we wanted. And so the development has taken place here on the Gold Coast. Um, it uses the evidence base and the background algorithm and architecture of the John Hopkins ACG tool that's used in about 20 countries around the world and has been used for 30 years. So really good evidence background in the coded diagnoses and the algorithms that help us find our really high risk patient. Uh, it's easy to use. The motto was that we wanted a tool that was fit for general practice. So we wanted it to be an aid and an addition that everyone wanted on their desktop in general practice, not something that hindered our workflow and not something that wasn't practical with the way general practice in Australia workflow exists in a fee for base of service. So we had an idea that we wanted prompts that were only high value. We didn't want to drive fatigue alert. We wanted only medically necessary um, prompts around medication uh, risk factors, and we wanted prompts for care plan item numbers for best evidence care to try and help drive quality and improvements in general practice. So it does assist busy GPs in their normal workflow. The safety medication alerts are meaningful and they're tied to patient data, and we've got good um, good evidence that GPs are interacting with them and changing how they approach their medication prescribing. So I think that uh, what does Primary Sense do? Um, it extracts the patient's clinical history and related data for the past five years or another set period. So for instance, in the hemochromatosis data, it goes all the way back. It extracts new and updated every few minutes so that it is able to be up to date, timely, and able to be relied upon as good data. It cleans and maps its data to international classification systems like ICDC-10, SNOMED, LOINC. Um, so it's got that international rec recognition that the coding is correct and fit for purpose. It runs the data through evidence-based algorithms um, including the Johns Hopkins ACG risk stratification tool that we discussed. Um, so that gives us the confidence that as GPs, we can rely on the data extraction that this tool is doing for us um, and that it is backed by evidence base. So it is a decision assist tool as well. So it delivers information to the GP by prompts at the point of care and it's real-time evidence-based medication safety alerts and other high risk and other important clinical prompts and notifications. And it's in a non-intrusive manner. We'll do a demonstration of it later. It's usually in the right-hand side of the screen. You can minimize it. And if you have had a prompt and it's timed out, you can go back to it and get it back later. Um, the beauty of this tool is that it's using de-identified data and we can switch on functionality so that things like a new low EGFR value that's come through will generate a medication prompt to say that certain medications are contraindicated because the EGFR has dropped below, for example, 30 with metformin and different levels as well for the digoxin prescribing. For prescribing 
Um, AZT, if there's been no TMP screening done, it'll give you a prompt and that can save a patient's life. And it's doing that at the point of going to prescribe. So it's timely uh, and it's in, in the GP's um, consciousness because it's happening at, in real time. It'll give immunization prompts for flu in chronic disease patients and antenatal patients that haven't had it. It'll give prompts for our Indigenous paediatric populations for their different vaccinations like the meningococcal B under two and the hepatitis A prompts. And it will give care plan prompts for chronic disease patients that are in the higher risk band. So it's not prompting just general um, care plan prompts, it's prompting those that are in that higher risk band and are worthy of doing care plans on. Um, so Primary Sense also delivers reports that highlight gaps in patient care um, at a patient and a clinician level and at practice levels. It aligns with inter interventions that the general practice business model approaches and workflow where possible. So things like um, it'll give prompts for care plans, it'll give prompts for health assessments, it'll give prompts for those missing vaccinations, it'll give prompts for just the missing items that are missing like the urine ACR pathology test, and it will only prompt if it's not already been completed. Um, it'll give prompts to do some interventions for patients that have a high cardiovascular risk score, and it automatically calculates that based on the data in the computer system. So it relies on blood pressure being put into the correct spot, and it relies on the medications being put in and the diagnoses being coded. Um, and so it'll give a prompt if your patient's in that high-risk group that should have some cardiovascular medications prescribed. And when the prompts come up, they have a link to the evidence base behind them. So the GP can go and look and can further evaluate whether or not they believe that the prompt's correct. And if it's not correct, they can then, in a timely manner, give a feedback back to the um, primary sense team that they think a prompt might be incorrect. So, for instance, sometimes we get cardiovascular prompts for high-risk patients that might be on weight loss medications like Ozempic. So the computer thinks they're a diabetic and thinks, therefore, that if they're over 65, they're high risk, they're over 20% high risk, and they should have some cardiovascular medications prescribed. So you can give that feedback to help with making sure that primary sense stays current and making sure it is evidence-based, but also um, it'll let you capture patients that might otherwise slip through the gaps. Sometimes patients flip between different GPs within the practice, and so no one feels like they own the patient and they don't feel like they should be the one starting statins or starting um, um, any anticoagulant type medications. So, I think by having these prompts in the GP's face, it just reminds us to do it. And I've had situations when I've been doing a vaccination clinic, like for flu shots or COVID shots, and a prompt's come up, and I've been able to quickly mention it to the patient and tell them that this needs to be actioned so that we're getting that extra buy-in for care with, whoops, with just um, the one visit. So care optimization is another feature of Primary Sense. It delivers reports highlighting areas to improve clinical care based on the health needs of the region. Um, and it informs practice staff on training and education and resources and pathways um, that might be relevant to their particular patient population. Sometimes when we look at our practice population, some practices have a really pediatric focused um, practice population. Some have a really chronic disease focused population. Some have some niche pop populations like sometimes a GP might have a special interest in COPD and they might have um, a higher number of patients that have got that particular disease. The beauty of primary sense is it doesn't just code the four chronic diseases that some of the old tools did. It creates um, codes for something like up to 30 or 40 different um, population health profiles of, of our practice population. So we can see it in much more um, detailed information. When we look at the patient population care optimization report, we can see patients that have got an indicated diagnosis like diabetes who aren't on medication, or COPD patients that aren't on, um, aren't on um, medications for COPD, or patients that haven't had their vaccinations for their chronic disease. Um, 
It also helps us target vaccinations to special high-risk groups like our antenatal population. So if a patient um, is already up to the 22-week mark and hasn't had the tetanus diphtheria and whooping cough injection, it'll prompt that. Sometimes in my head, I think if I've done something and I've told the patient to go out to the nurse and, and have their vaccinations when they're pregnant, in my mind, I've done it and I don't think to keep reminding myself to do it. But sometimes patients might run out of time that day or they might feel sick and not follow through or they might not be quite ready to vaccinate and proceed to vaccination. So by having these prompts in our faces, it just basically does translate the evidence. We all know that anyone who's pregnant needs to have those pregnancy vaccinations, but it helps to translate it into outcomes um, by giving those timely prompts, but also having them on a database sheet that you can pull out and do a clinic of specific things if you wanted to. Um, you can use the practice reports for QPIP and a seamless log of events to do this and tools are available on the Gold Coast PHN website. There's lots of different topics for the QPIP activities. Um, and so your practice can decide at a practice level what quality improvement they want to tackle for their QPIP projects and work as a team, a multidisciplinary team with the nurses involved, practice managers involved and the GPs on board. Um, and by having these prompts in our faces to remind us to do things, um, it kind of makes it a very easy QPIP type activity if you are going to select one of the activities that has prompts already constructed for it. Um, sometimes I use the prompts to educate my patients. So for instance, there's quite a few patients I might have been working on for a while to think about taking a statin. Um, and sometimes, you know, despite me trying to counsel them, it hasn't worked. And this prompt about cardiovascular risk medication is just another tool where I can even show them and say, look, the computer even says you need it. Um, it has the links, so you can go to the links under the prompts to find more information and resources. For instance, on the pregnancy immunization prompts, you might find that there's a link there to go to Sky or Mums and Bums vaccinations or the NCRS vaccinations. So we can use these prompts to help GPs find quick resources that they might not otherwise be aware of. Um, and you can use the practice reports to get workflow happening legitimately for new doctors or new registrars. So we have quite a few registrars in our practice. Um, and certainly um, I've been able to show them the primary sense tool and be able to give them the um, ability to go and look at some patients um, that have outstanding care items like vaccinations, who might also happen to have chronic kidney disease. And that way, if they are learning about a specific topic, they can then go and do that with some of the chronic patients that we have and legitimately see them. Um, if you had a doctor that's left the practice, sometimes the chronic disease patients are floating around and falling through the gaps and they haven't necessarily established with another replacement doctor. So you could have the replacement doctor have a look at the reports and search under Dr. X who's left the practice and legitimately recall those patients that have um, some high value care items outstanding with some high value care, um, care incidents that are required. So with the John Hopkins tool, we are able to slice and dice our practice population into risk bands. And if there's um, like a shortage of vaccinations, we are able to deploy our COVID vaccinations to our high risk risk band five group. A risk band five group usually is multimorbid with chronic disease, usually things like CKD plus diabetes, plus maybe heart disease. And if you're in risk band five, a lot of the data from overseas says that you've got about an 80% chance of being hospitalized in the next 12 months. So you're able to focus your care and target to that group of, of patients and legitimately do care plans on them annually, I would think, and reviews probably three monthly rather than six monthly if they're that complex. Um, but obviously you need to make sure you're meeting the MBS rules. So what does Primary Sense do for GPs under care reviews? So it does provide reports and dashboards on improvements and performance. It monitors intention to treat and clinical changes and outcomes. So it allows continuous quality improvement to take place in the practice for all areas. It also helps to drive better coding. So once people start to interact with Primary Sense and they realize that it's helping them um, save their 
um, prescribing when they are putting in correct coding like CKD or um, other diseases. It's allowing them to interact with the tool and then that in itself often drives better coding. But also too, if you get a prompt that says you need to do medication reviews, um, sometimes I look at it and go, well, that doesn't make sense. And then I realise that there's a whole pile of medications there that haven't been inactivated or changed. Um, sometimes you realise that maybe your code has been interpreted wrong. So I've noticed that if I'm putting in Asperger's diagnosis, I sometimes shorten that to ASD. But I think when I was coding it, it was interpreting that as an ASD cardiac um, patient. So coding becomes a learning process and you learn how to put the coding in. And once you've got the coding in, it helps with your letters to be more accurate. It helps with uploading to my health record. Once you've got your medication list accurate, it helps with all those processes as well. Um, and so by having a look at the intention to treat care review reports, it helps us continue to wrap care around those patients that otherwise might fall through the gaps, especially at the moment when we're dealing with such a busy time in, in pandemic time. I know that you know, my focus at the moment is open the file and look and see if they need a flu shot or a COVID shot. Well, this program will prompt us for our chronic disease patients if they need a flu shot. And often if they need a flu shot, they'll often need a, a COVID shot. <clears throat> so transitioning from traditional um, CQI activity to digital CQI activity, well, hopefully it'll be a lot more seamless. Hopefully the reports you'll find are really quick to generate and we'll show you some demonstrations of that later. Um, it is just one click, so you don't have to put in filters, you don't have to put in codes, it is one click to get the report. What I like is it does stratify those patients into different bands and different levels. You know, sometimes I feel like when I'm doing my health assessments on the over 75s, if I'm seeing the 75 year old that's just gone off hiking to Woolpina Pound like my one last week, I kind of feel like it's almost a bit of a waste of, of my time doing it, but you still find you do pick things up. And it's still important, I think, to have those annual health assessments done to pick up dementia and things like that early. But I'd like it if there was a um, restriction on my ability to service all my patients by doing health assessments, I'd like to think that we did conquer those ones that were most at need so that we do have equitable health care delivered to those that are most vulnerable. Um, so certainly if you were getting a chronic disease nurse in who was really adept at doing your over 75 health assessments, you could use these reports to pull out those risk band five patients and get them done. If you had a newer nurse that was just starting and hadn't had a lot of experience in doing health assessments, you could maybe pull out the easier bands for her to to start with and to start that journey of doing health assessments on. So I think that this tool's got lots of different deployment in both a business sense and a quality improvement sense and a teaching sense and um, safety sense. And I think it's up to each practice to play with it. You can't break it and to think about it at their team meetings, how they want to deploy it and how they want to use it. And even as a GP, how you want to use it. You know, I find that I like going into the reports for things like the antenatal patients and just clicking my name and just bringing up that report and just making sure that I have targeted all my antenatal patients for the vaccinations. Um, so it's up to each person to think about how they're going to use it. Um, at the moment, the tool is um, currently transitioned to Western Australian Primary Health Alliance so that it will be a national tool. 11 out of the 31 or 32 PHNs around the country have signed up to get this in the next 12 months. And then there's quite a few more that will be coming on board after that. Um, obviously the whole aim of this tool is to deliver better quality care to our patients, to get GPs to be able to practice at the top of their scope, to find those patients missing in action. You know, I know I've still got quite a few of my old patients that haven't come back yet from the last six to 12 months, because they're still a bit worried about coming into general practice during a pandemic. Um, so it helps us find those people that are a bit missing in action. Um, with the downloadable reports, you can sort them by GP, you can sort them by risk band, you can sort them by most of the columns there. Um, and that way you can decide how you're going to tackle the burden of catch up care that we do have to do in general practice at the moment. Um, 
So complexity and hospitalization risk is calculated. I've talked a little bit about that, but it's calculated by the same input data and complexity bands as the patients in primary sense are calculated by the adjusted clinical group, which is a John Hopkins tool. Um, and as I said, that's been in existence for over 30 years um, and it's in 20 different countries and it's been validated in lots of different healthcare settings, including general practice. Um, so it's been used in the UK as well in a general practice setting similar to Australia. One of the interesting reports they had from the UK was that uh, there was a look at frequent referrers to emergency departments by GPs practices and they were able to look at the different practices from one to ten and practice ten might have been the highest referrer per, per patient basis. But when you looked at the complexity bands, it was able to show that practice 10 actually was one of the lowest referrals when you looked and took into account complexity bands. The expected number of referrals should have been double or triple that. So I think for us in Australia, that helps us with looking at our complexity. We're all a little bit worried when we do our care plans, whether or not we might get a PSR audit. Um, we're all a little bit worried when we get those letters from pathology uh, in Australia saying that, you know, we've done too many tests. But It'd be interesting to be able to have a different way of interpreting data rather than just numbers, being able to take into account complexity banding. As we all know, um, it feels like general practice is now doing the service that general physicians did 20 years ago when I first graduated. Um, and we are certainly doing a lot more chronic complex care, um, which obviously needs to be um, needs to be done correctly and properly to keep our patients out of hospital. So the primary sense prompts um, appear when the patient is um, in front of the GP and as they open the GP record. So before you call the GP, the patient in, you'll get that prompt pop up. They've been designed so they only contain three items at a time and they've been given a clinical priority and order of appearance. Um, when one element's action, that allows a subsequent element to appear on the next prompt. The more information um, section allows the GP to look in and work out what the rationale is behind it and understand it. Um, and it takes them to links that are appropriate. So it's a very interactive and easy to use tool. And most people find that they can start using it even at the level of just the prompts immediately. So I think um, even if nothing else, I would just encourage your GPs to just interact with the prompts, read the pop-up boxes um, and just click on the links if they want further information. So currently the prompts are there for influenza vaccination, pertussis vaccination, meningococcal and hep A for our indigenous patients, a prompt for considering hemochromatosis testing, missing CV risk medications, heart health check assessments due, microalbumin pathology due to be ordered for CKD or diabetes patients, care plans due for those chronic complex patients, mental health care plans due, and medication reviews. Um, and we've noticed that the medication reviews are driving a nice tidy up of medication lists. Um, I find that the prompts are good safety mechanisms, especially in those large practices where there's lots of different doctors and registrars looking after the patients. The medication alerts are really good. I've had instances where um, an EGFR might have been ordered by a colleague and I might not have seen that. And then you go to prescribe it and the prompt is there. So it's prompting you about new changes that you might not otherwise have been aware about. Um, it's prompting high value care plans to be done for the high risk band patients. And that means that um, when you focus on those care bundles and longer consults, you're essentially buying GP time to be enabling wrapping care around these patients to keep them out of hospital. So the medication alerts you can see look something like this in primary sense. Um, before we developed the medication alerts, a literature review was done of all the studies with existing prescribing indicators in general practice um, and a review of the government therapeutic warnings um, and UK government drug safety updates and the US Food and Drug Administration drug safety communications. So that way we did a review of the contemporary GP prescribing guidelines and look for the areas that had gaps around them. So for instance, things like those targeted new EGFR alerts for 
metformin and um, digoxin and the targeted ordering um, for patients that were about to start on something like AZT who hadn't had their enzyme check done. Um, so it explains the options the GP has. So when you see the medication alert, the GP can say, um, just ignore. And so sometimes if you're really busy and you're just checking results and you've clicked into the file and it gives you a prompt, you might do that and it will then give you another reminder next time. Um, if you're ignoring it for a reason and you think it's not correct, it'd be great if you can write a reason in there so that that helps us with our own CQI, this tool. Um, so for instance, sometimes you might get an alert around the um, over-prescribing of diabetic medications in inverted commas for patients who've got hemoglobin A1Cs in the low sixes. Um, and that might prompt if you've got a patient who's on diabetic medications for weight loss, like Ozempic. Um, and so you might then go back and, and write in the tool, this patient's on a weight loss drug, so they're not a diabetic, so I'm going to ignore it. Um, and that just helps us with our CQI if you're putting some information in like that, if you think it's incorrect or if there's a good reason why you're ignoring it. Um, if you prompt the remind me next time, that's useful if you're not the usual doctor. So it might be that you don't want to go in and change something if you're not the usual doctor, if there's not a clinical urgency around that. Or if the practice nurse is looking at the patient list, she might click that remind me next time so that it'll come up for the next or not relevant to me is the other option you can click. Um, and we found that with the prompts, we have a really good interaction rate on the Gold Coast with our medication alerts and prompts and medication changes um, do occur. Um, so this is the next slide that shows the primary sense medication alerts. And it shows that um, so on this next slide, it shows, we'll go to the next slide, it shows prescribing azithromycin and mecaptopurine without thiopyramine methyl transferase testing. Um, I've certainly had a patient that popped up with that prompt. And um, it was a patient that I hadn't seen for a while, had seen some of my colleagues, had been to a specialist, had been prescribed medication for inflammatory bowel disease. And I hadn't ordered the blood test and it had a blood test that showed a really low hemoglobin and low white cell count and the medication prompt popped up in my face. So, um, I mean, obviously this patient had a bad outcome, but ideally this would have happened beforehand. And it did enable me to be able to go, right, stop that straight away. We know what this is likely to be um, and um, enabled that medication to be seized immediately. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's, um, patient factors and doctors factors that don't follow through with what we know is best evidence. So a patient might've been given a blood test form to get the enzyme done and not gone through and, and had it done yet started on the medication. So I think that this is just a safety net in our busy times while we're dealing with the pandemic. <clears throat> so the primary sense reports that are available at this present time listed on this next slide. And you can see that there's lots of different options that you can go in and click. And I find the best way to understand them is to just click and open them. The first time you open them for the day, it sometimes takes a little bit of time to download. But if you go back and open them later on, it'll open up pretty much immediately. Um, so the patient list reports re-identify the patient at the practice level only with suggested interventions or possible Medicare benefit. Um, items that could be due to help you wrap care around them. So as you know, all the patient data that is extracted is de-identified and the PHN has no visibility around our patient identities. Um, when it's fed back to the practice, the process algorithm allows it to be re-identified for that practice who has the patient at it so they can identify those patients. So there's all sorts of reports there. There's benzodiazepine reports, there's COVID-19 vulnerable patients, there's pregnancy and vaccination reports, hemochromatosis reports, diabetes reports, patients with moderate complexity, band three. You know, sometimes we target only the high end, most vulnerable patients, but sometimes it'd be nice to go back and target those that are in that low band three and look at interventions like wrapping around exercise programs or lifestyle interventions for those patients that might be 
pre-cardiovascular patients or pre-diabetic patients. <clears throat> There's the report there with patients that are complex band five and four. So with those, you know that you really should be seeing them regularly. We should be wrapping all the care we can around them and we should be doing our care plans probably annually on that group. There's a breast and bowel cancer screening um, table, chronic lung disease and asthma, cardiovascular disease risk factors and health assessments. Um, <clears throat> so the reports are searchable by doctor and wristband, but we'll see that in the demo later. There's also summary reports that provide an aggregate view of the patient information at a patient or practitioner level, and that helps with shaping services. So for instance, obviously you could pull your diabetic list and you could have a diabetes educator in for a day and line up the patients that you think would be most useful by using that. You could have a respiratory nurse that might be coming into the practice to help with a COPD specialised clinic. Um, Obviously, all these activities rely on good quality data. So we have that adage, data quality um, in equals data quality out. But this tool does do some of the cleaning of the data for us. Um, so the PIP-QI reports are also available on the downloadable list. They're simple to use. They keep track of the practice activities and they're simple to submit. Um, there's also further resources on the Gold Coast PHN website for many of the PIP QI topics. So Primary Sense at the moment um, has this capability. We're hopeful that as it rolls out nationally, we'll be increasing the available reports and capability. But at the moment, this is um, what's available. You can use the practice data in these tables to do your own self audit for RSCGP CME type points. So um, for GPs that haven't done that yet for this tri &M, that would be a good option to have a look at using the primary sense tool to pull a list of patients and interact with them. Um, the primary sense national clinical advisory group um, was established with its first meeting held on the 31st of May. So it's a national group that consists of GPs, clinical specialists, representatives from RSCGP and ACRAM um, and the Australian Association of Practice Management. Uh, and its function is to be an advisory and feedback body through the development of primary sense as it becomes um, version two. And hopefully PHNs around Australia will nominate additional members to include GPs from other states um, and other specialties um, and some other industry peak bodies. I mean, I think the exciting thing about this tool is that it is essentially owned by the PHNs around the country um, and is being deployed and developed for fit for purpose Australian PHN use and general practice use and improving outcomes. So this is the primary sense report, as you can see here on the screen. If you click here, as Lisa was showing you, reports, which we can click here, and that shows you all the reports that are in the primary sense tool. If you open a report, you simply double click and it will open for you. I have downloaded these prior, so we'll look at health assessments first, what that report shows you. Here you go, Lisa, if you want to talk to this one. <clears throat> so this is the health assessment for the 40 to 49 year old age group, but there's also one for the over 75 age group and indigenous um, population group. Um, so you can just click on, for instance, uh, the GP name. So over to the right, that's it. And you can see then you've um, sought by GP. So Dr. G. Robinson could go down and find all his patients. Um, you can search by last visit. So you can find the ones that are um, probably in the last two years. You know, if there may be five years since they came for the last visit, you probably presume they don't still belong to your practice. But if they've been here in the last one to two years, you'd expect they are still part of your practice. Um, you can export this to an Excel spreadsheet so you can then interact with HotDoc to recall your patients. Um, and you can see on the right, you can search by at sea identification as to whether or not they they identify as Indigenous. Yeah. This report here is patients with high complexity, five and four. So certainly um, when we were going through the pandemic and we had um, reduced doses of the vaccine when we were initially rolling out, 
we would use this to try and get our highest risk patients in first um, and write a list of 50 or 100 patients to bring in for our vaccination clinics to try and get them through the door first. You can see from this list, you can search by care plans due, you can search by last medication review, you can search by hospital risk scores, you can search by Indigenous status, you can search by age. So it gives you lots of different options to be able to click on the button and just retile that and research under that particular way. And as I said, you can't break it. So it's worth just downloading and playing on your own desktop till you get a bit of a feel for how it works and how you want it to work for you. Yeah. This report here looks like pregnant and vaccinations. And it's important to note too, all the data that you are seeing today is dummy data also. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so this is definitely just uh, not real patients. Um, so you can see, you can search for pregnant women without a record of a vaccination for pertussis or influenza. So I like to do that every three or four weeks and just check that my patients are getting through and getting vaccinated um, at the right time in their pregnancy. But it will also prompt as they come in. Um, you know, if you had a nurse that was um, able to do a flu clinic, this is another easy way of just calling everyone in who's due and high value to be targeting for care. And here is the final report here, which we'll go through tonight, Lisa. Yeah, so the hemochromatosis report, I think, is one of those clinical risk governance reports that is worth paying some attention to. Um, we know that people that have a transference saturation over the range of 45 and ferritin over the range of, I think, 50 on two occasions are at a high risk of having hemochromatosis. It's a really high incidence of the gene. It's something like one in 300 or one in 500 carry the hemochromatosis gene. And we know it's a recessive gene. You have to have two copies of it to develop it. We know men are more at risk because of the fact that they don't tend to have periods, which helps us lose the iron, um, which is the treatment for hemochromatosis. So, you know, if you've got people on your hemochromatosis list and you haven't done the gene test, it's one of those things where it is a bit of a clinical governance thing. Um, and in the past, we used to have to go back through all our blood test reports to see if a hemochromatosis gene's been done. This is filtering for us and taking that work away. So it's building that... Um, level of security and safety netting, but also saving time and driving efficiency, which is the name of the game. You know, I was talking to the developer today saying, wouldn't it be lovely if we were able to code the algorithm for antivirals for every GP in Australia? Imagine how much time that would save. I know personally in the last week, I've probably invested three or four hours trying to get my head around the contraindications, the indications, the medical contraindications, you know, imagine if we had that. And, you know, possibly with future developments, that will be something that will come. So, you know, so by coding a COVID infection, it would pop up a little pop-up that would say, your patient is eligible for antivirals or your patient is contraindicated for this antiviral but is indicated for this viral. So the future is limitless. Obviously, it comes down to resourcing. But I think at the end of the day, um, this is a tool that as general practitioners we can play with. It'll help to drive quality improvement. It'll help to safety net us. It'll help in our teaching roles. It'll help in our patient roles. It'll help in our community health deployment. During the PHN um, epidemic management, we were able to hotspot COVID vaccine, sorry, COVID testing in lifetime. So we had little heat maps we could show in the very beginning of the pandemic where COVID testing was being requested uh, and done. And that way, we were able to help to decide where some respiratory clinics should be located. But you could apply that to anything, you know, with COPD, you could heat map COPD diagnoses and you could heat map where treatment hasn't been done. So all that is possible. It all comes down to resourcing. Um, and this tool is something that I hope you'll find as useful as I have. I hope you'll go and play with it in your practices, take it back to your practice meetings and I hope you'll be able to you know, launch it and use it quite easily and seamlessly. Thank you for that, Lisa. Just being cautious of time, I will quickly show you the demo of what a primary sense prompt and medication alert if you give us two minutes. So the first is what we call a primary sense medication alert. 
if you're a GP and you had primary sense installed on your workstation, just like this, there's no need for you to log into primary sense. If you had best practice or medical uh, director open for a practice and you're about to prescribe a particular medication, whether it's a contradiction for prescribing that medication, this medication alert here would pop up on your screen as Lisa was describing earlier. So from that, it'll give you the patient's name, the medication, the possible impairment with prescribing that medication. And down here, recommendations for you, the GP, to take. And from that, there is the patient's pathology results over the last two years down here at the bottom. And the GP does have these options here as Lisa was earlier describing. Is there anything you'd like to add, Lisa, to that? Yeah, I guess I would just write that um, if you can give us any feedback about these alerts, if you think they're not correct, that's really useful. Um, sometimes you might put in there appropriate, but want to override because you might think the EGFRs just dropped because they had gastroenteritis. And that's totally fine. At the end of the day, the GP has clinical governance over these medication alerts. Thank you for that. And the other feature here, which I'll show you, is what we call primary sense prompts as Lisa was talking to. So here is the prompt here. It would appear in front of you as you have the patient's file open for some of your complex patients, three, four or five as classified by ACG. You'll see the complexity score of the patient up here, chronic conditions, the hospital risk score. And then here you will see some of these. So this patient here, O. Johnson, who's a dummy patient, is due for a care plan due for our influenza vaccination, and also due for a medication review. So the GP could say to O. Johnson, would you like to book in for a care plan at reception on your way out, or if they had time, action it there. Would you like to add anything, Lisa? I think just the important thing is if you want to keep getting those prompts hit next time, once you hit agree action, they go um, away for, I think, three month period until um, they come back so that if you want to stop being prompted, you can just click agree action. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. I will stop sharing my screen now. Did anyone have any questions? Was there any questions at all we had? Luke said um, he finds primary sense helpful in optimizing patient care and not falling between the caps. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> Thank you, Luke, for that. If there's no further questions, thank you all for attending tonight and thank you, Dr. Beecham, for speaking to Primary Sense. Muchly appreciated. We will make this resource available online. So you will receive it, obviously, in the GP and general practice news. So you can also share it with your colleagues who couldn't make it tonight. And Thank there is all. an online, I forgot to say, there's an online module about the use of primary sense. So there's an online user guide on the PHN website. So you can download the, the booklet and have a read through that as well. Thank you all. Have a Thank nice you. night.